fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCP 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. All right, you made it back into the House of Mystery. And I'm hosting today Al Warren. And of course, with me is Dr. Joe Yusinski. Al, great to be with you. Very excited for today's episode. Real excited. It's another one of those fun episodes where we talk about the world and the way we see it. Um, so uh, joining us today is uh, author of The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, and he's uh, one of the hosts on Skeptic's Guide 5x5 five 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 podcast. We've got Evan Bernstein. Thank you for being here. Gentlemen, thank you so much for having me. Oh, I feel I just want to let that resonate, gentlemen. <laughs> I haven't been called something that good in a long time. Yeah, we don't get that normally. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think it's damning you with faint grace. Uh, <laughs> it's just well, a nice way to say when there's a, a more than one ma uh, male that I'm speaking to, gentlemen. I, I tend to be in the habit of saying that kind of thing. So I hope you're both doing well. And again, thank you for having me. Well, I think we're doing well. Um, Good. I appreciate you being here. So um, now your book, Skeptic Guide to the Universe. Um, really, what 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 was the creation of that? How did you and, and the rest of you guys uh, get together on this and decide to do the book? Wow, what a, that's a big question. I don't well, know whether you know it or not, that what you've asked there. <laughs> how, did, how did we get to making this book? It's... Uh, that is 23 years in the making, if you can believe it or not. And I'll try to condense this down for you to a point where it won't bore the audience. So 1996, we, that's where we have to go back to, when myself and the host of our show, which is the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe podcast, Stephen Novella, uh, his brother Robert, and our mutual friend by the name of Perry DeAngelis, decided to start a local skeptics group here in our home state of Connecticut because there wasn't a local skeptics group. There was at the time the larger national organization at the time known as PSYCOP, of which there were very, some very uh, famous and, and well-known members, including Carl Sagan, the amazing James Randi, Paul Kurtz, among others. However, local organizations were occurring around the country, but they were kind of scattered a little you know, just each of them having their own local territory. But there was nothing in New England, certainly nothing in Connecticut. And we decided, well, we're all interested in, in the world of skepticism. Why don't we start at a local level and create our own? And we did. It was called the Connecticut Skeptical Society. And we ran some meetings. We brought in some uh, lecturers, some people who had authored books on the subject, and got a pretty pretty robust little group going for, for a local skeptics group, a couple hundred people in our organization. The next year, we turned into the New England Skeptical Society when Massachusetts and some all the other states in New England, they hadn't had any uh, formidable or really robust skeptics groups of any kind. So we branched out a bit, became the New England Skeptical Society in 1997. And we started to develop some relationships with some of the other skeptics groups around the country and also the national group which was PSYCOP. Um, also, Michael Shermer's group was coming about at that time, and James Randi, the James Randi Educational Foundation, was also uh, coming to coming to force around that time. So we made some alliances and had a nice little network going on there. So fast forward to the year 2004, when the whole iTunes and, uh, and podcasting phenomenon, even though it wasn't a phenomenon at the time, had just started to become... Well, somewhat popular. Some, you know, the public became aware that there was this thing called podcast, and we decided, well, we've been doing this local skeptics group thing for quite a long time now, and maybe it was time to move on to another medium. And we found out that 
we had had already had sort of 10 years of doing eight years, frankly, of doing this kind of work and research and local investigations and other things that we were doing under our belt. We had plenty of material to create a, our own podcast. There weren't really any other skeptic podcasts out there or the ones that were out there that came along with us. Um, we're just, just getting underway. So we all kind of hit the scene at the same time. And we launched our first show in May 2005, The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. And since then, we've been producing that show weekly. Uh, so that's 14 plus years at this point. Our companion podcast, as you mentioned earlier, was called Skeptic's Guide 5x5, Five Five, in which we, it was a little five-minute uh, companion podcast to the main podcast, in which we would break down a specific skeptical topic and condense it into a little five-minute conversation among the five hosts that we had on the show. For many years, since 2004, 2005, when we first got started, because this is getting back to your original question, I told you this was a big, big question you asked. <laughs> How did we get to the book? Well, we've been wanting to write a book for quite some time, really, since around the time uh, we started the podcast. We started talking about it. What would it be? Where would we go with it? What subject would we cover? And we were just waiting for the right opportunity to come along and do it. Uh, and that opportunity did come along in late 2016 when some publishers started to reach out to us. Our, po our The popularity of our podcast by then, 10, 11 years in, had grown to a certain level that it, you know, it was time. It was the right time to hatch a book at that point. So we dealt with some different publishing companies and in 2017 we signed on we actually wrote the book in 2017 and 2018 and it came out in october of 2018 so we're celebrating the one-year anniversary of the book as we speak and that's how the book became it is effectively the podcast in a book so if i was going to go to the book what are, what are the chapters organized around what am i going to find out um in, in, in the book that i might not already know that you may not already know. I mean, there's plenty of things in here, and we have it worked out or seg uh, segmented in certain chapters mm -hmm. uh, in which you could use it in a couple of different ways. You can use it as a reference guide. If you're looking for a specific topic having to do with science, skept scientific skepticism, uh, rationality, and other similar topics, it is laid out that you can go and get about 60 or 70 different specific topics. For example, you can go in and you can look up about the placebo effect. We have an entire chapter dedicated to that. You can go in there and look for what conspiracy theories are all about. We've got a chapter dedicated to that. And there's sixty or about 60 or 70 of these individual topics that you go to. But you can also take the book and read it cover to cover because it's kind of a narrative. Not only is it sort of about the podcast, it's about our journey that the five of us have taken when we first sort of all became skeptics or aware of what skepticism was and how we began and how it has evolved in that time, what we've learned along the way. The overarching theme of the book, I would say, is that we as people, we have these human brains, our human brains, <laughs> as much as we love them, they are wonderful, incredible forces of nature. They are not perfect by any stretch, and they deceive us, essentially. They trick us. They give us all sorts of shortcuts that we're not even aware of. It. A lot of this happens in the background. But the more you can be aware of these sorts of pitfalls that the human brain can experience, the more skeptical, essentially, you become of certain things, and the less likely you are to find yourself in situations in life in which you're being, oh, flim-flammed by con artists or being able to explain things that would otherwise be inexplicable to you or you would otherwise say, wow, that is supernatural. There must be some other force beyond the laws of physics at work here that cannot be explained because that's the only way to look at this. It helps you avoid those sorts of mental cognitive errors that we all have. We all have these things in our mind from biases to being able to see you know, faces in the clouds that we <laughs> think are faces or certain experiences that we would otherwise call paranormal because we have no other way to define it. So that's the overarching theme of the book, is how to understand the various ways your brain tries to effectively trick you. 
So do you think that it's all just psychological processing problems that we have? Or, or do you think, you know, for me, I mean, judging by my family, I mean, I used to believe a whole lot of nonsense. <laughs> but it's just because I was brought up with it. You raise an interesting point there because you were brought up with it. So your culture and your environment is an yeah. enormous factor in these things. You see, we're not born skeptics. We're not born with these minds that are that are essentially doubting what it is we are seeing, what it is we are hearing, what it is we are in some cases even smelling or touching. Our brain has certain ways in which it takes basically shortcuts because there's so much going on in the human brain in, in the processing that if you were to stop and think about it, you wouldn't be able to do anything else. You'd effectively be frozen. So it's a necessary component of your of your thinking. And again, we all, all of us experience it. None of us are born skeptics. It's an important thing to learn at some point in your life if you want to avoid a lot of the pitfalls that life has to offer, whether it's your falling into the traps of your own mind or other people trying to convince you of things that just aren't true. So I'm looking at the Amazon page, and I would recommend this book to anyone. It's rated 4.8 out of 5, which is an incredibly high rating for for a book of this nature. But instead of focusing on the uh, um, positive reviews, let me hit you with some of the negative reviews and get your in, and get your feedback here. Please. And I'll, I'll I'll condense these. So um, one star, um, and he says disappointing. And his argument seems to be that you are siding with mainstream climate science, mm-hmm. and you're siding with Michael Mann, who is one of the most prominent climate scientists out there. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you have to say about climate science? Climate science. Here's what I have to say about that. We know. I'll give you an example of how how I think it's a way we can understand this a little bit more clearly. We have a lot of evidence that the Earth goes around the sun, a lot of evidence. Now, that wasn't always the case. It took, it took humanity a good amount of time to eventually not only figure that out, raise the point, but get entire collective society to accept that as a scientific fact. You bring that up today, there are very few except maybe some flat earthers, flat earth believers out there who may have some interesting arguments against you. But for the most part, for the most part, that science is pretty much settled. And I would say that there is, we are approaching a point in which we have achieved enough data from various branches of sciences that is approaching something amounting to the amount of evidence that we have that the earth goes around the sun that humans are having not only an Im- not only an impact on our climate and our and our weather and patterns and and so many other things but that we are the chief cause of it there are other things going on but certainly we are chiefly responsible for it the quantity of quality evidence that is there is really really hard to refute i get what they're saying about Michael Mann, he's had also some controversies of his own in the past, which is another topic probably for another day. But he's not, but he's not wrong. The evidence that he's been using has been cited certainly and verified by so many other scientists. It's really, really hard to refute it. If you're going to refute it, please come back and give us whomever wrote this review. Show us what you have on your side of the argument saying that that's not the case. And we'll gladly, we'll gladly examine it, what you have to say. Because we're not interested in a fixed result and that we backtrack and try to make the pegs fit the right holes because we are invested in a specific result. The proper way to do this is to take a look at the evidence that is out there. The quantity of evidence, the quality of evidence and measure it solely by that not interested in what the out in what the end result is but it's the process of how to correctly correctly look at this evidence analyze it and make good decisions based on that and all of it and i do mean all of the quality evidence no doubt that climate change is definitely occurring and humans are responsible for it you know, it's really strange because one of those scientific findings where the evidence has gotten stronger and the scientific 
uh, consensus has gotten stronger too. Uh, public opinion and elite opinion have both become more polarized over time. Um, it seems to be going back in the other direction, um, but, it, but, but it was just sort of really strange that as the science got better, people became more skeptical of it. Um, okay, negative review number two. Now, mm -hmm. this, is a ju this is a juicy one. Okay. Uh, this person is very upset with you. Mm -hmm. um, because um, you don't you, you don't uh, look at the evidence that he says is available to show that acupuncture mm -hmm. um, is safe and effective, and you glance over that. So what do you have to say there? That the evidence is safe and effective for acupuncture. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's a pretty broad. That's a pretty broad statement. <laughs> what we can say. Po positively, as far as evidence-wise goes, is that acupuncture does not have a, a valid medical purpose to it, and the results have shown in the good in the good quality um, literature out there and studies that have been performed that there is a null effect that is a simply a placebo effect and nothing nothing more than that. You can find articles, you can find papers that are published, mainly from people within the acupuncture field, <laughs> that are going to show you, yes, I have a positive correlation here. You see, this is, a, this is not just background noise. We have something very positive here. Okay, well, you take a look at those studies and you realize that there are some inherent flaws in their methodology. Not all studies are the same. It's great to say, I've got a study that shows X. Okay. That's good, but what is that really getting you? What is the quality of that study? That's where the devil is in the details. Not all studies are the same. And just because someone waves around a piece of paper saying they have a study saying something, it really doesn't mean anything. You have to delve down. You have to get to people who know exactly what it is they're reading. The lay public does not know, for the most part, how to delve into these technical journals, into these technical papers, and weed out the important parts or realize what the flaws in the study are. Now, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a scientist myself. I've had to learn this through my decades of being part of a skeptical organization that when you are out of your field, when I'm when I am on here talking to you, respectively, what's a medical topic, I'm not I'm not personally qualified to do that. So when I'm not qualified to do that, what will I do? I will go to people who are qualified to do that people who have the certain prerequisites, the certain training, the certain experiences. And what they will tell you is that when you tighten the controls on these studies, the phenomenon disappears. Tighter the controls, the more it disappears. What does that tell you? The phenomenon is not real. So, you know, good for them that they have evidence claiming that acupuncture is a, is a real phenomenon that is worthwhile and a benefit to people. Let's have a look at it. Let's see what the experts have to say about it. And I think what they'll find out is that there's a lot of flaws with whatever paper it is they're going to be citing. Okay. Next one. Now, this gets even better. And maybe there's a topic here that maybe you can introduce us to because I haven't even heard of this. So this person's claim is, is that you guys are critics of all things natural and are disciples of pharmacopoeia. Mm -hmm. And you've written a baseless negative attack on halo therapy. Oh boy, halo therapy. So what is halo therapy, and are you truly disciples of pharmacopoeia? My gosh, are we <laughs> <laughs> disciples? Right. Are we, are we basically shills for medical companies, <laughs> I suppose, would be the... Um, <laughs> that may be what they're kind, saying. It's kind, of the translation, it's kind of the translation here, you know, whether it's a... Uh, Holotherapy or, or so many other things that, you know, people have, you know, ac accused us of. But let's, well, I'll, 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 I'll try to answer this in maybe in, in a more broad sense. So, yes, we get accusations like this you know, regularly. Um, and it's, it's a baseless, it's obviously a baseless attack, we, we believe. It's not true. <laughs> We're not in league with any pharmaceutical companies or other 
groups that would otherwise want to give us money to say the things that that we say and you know where wherever they pull that from is you know from the depths of their own imagination i suppose um so there's really you know we get baseless accusations similar to that quite quite a bit but i can understand let's talk a little bit about what they mention in the in the term natural where that we're against natural remedies no i that's that's not the case but what we have to do we have to be careful about this because words do mean things what is natural what is natural ask people ask someone ask 10 people on the street what natural is you know you're going to get 10 different responses well here's what we believe natural is natural is a marketing phenomenon it's a marketing campaign in which companies will use it to in order to sell whatever it is they're selling their supplement their food product their wellness cure whatever however you want to classify it it boils down to marketing because natural sounds good it's very pleasing it's a it's a soothing kind of word that people have oh great yeah natural let's get back to nature okay what is it oh i don't know but it really really sounds great okay so i'll just do whatever it is that's natural uh, uh, may i quote james randy sure at, at this point and i'm not going to use the obscenity i'll i'll, I'll change the <laughs> word that he, that he used Bird crap and gravel are natural, but I'm not going to eat them. <laughs> it's one of my favorite things I've ever heard James Randi say. It's basically he's telling his audience and what we're telling our audience, what are you talking about? Natural really doesn't mean anything in that context. Okay, but let's take it a little step further. Are there things in nature that do have positive benefits for people? when they consume it and the answer to that is yes so long as it goes through the proper identification testing dosage amounts these these sorts of things matter again i'm not a doctor the host of our show steven novella is a doctor and he tells me and he tells the audience he prescribes in that context natural ingredients all the time he'll he'll prescribe vitamins so he'll, he'll he will prescribe um certain supplements for people who are who have a deficiency in the thing it is they need and they will get from that supplement but it isn't just willy-nilly do it because it's natural it just so happens that that's the most appropriate course of treatment for that particular thing and yes among his bag of items that he can help people with there are some things in there that are that do occur naturally in nature they get taken or they get then foregrown in the lab crushed down to a powder and here you go this will this will help you in some ways so we're not anti-natural just because you know we speak out against the fact that natural in the broader context has become this marketing gimmick that so many people have fallen for on so many levels and boy we don't even know it the whole antioxidants you've heard of we all have heard of antioxidants. Sure, I mean, every product out there, so they say, good. we have antioxidants in it. But, oh, I mean, my gosh. It, it, yes, it, does so, it do anything? Does it do anything? It does do things. <laughs> and, they're not, and, and, they're, and they're not good. And guess what? They're not good. It's been looked into 10-plus years of rigorously looking at what antioxidants are doing to the body and the free radicals and dealing with the free radicals of the body. The antioxidants, in some cases, are worse for you. You don't want to increase your antioxidant level. The body will produce, or through the food it takes and through its own natural processes, will develop the antioxidants that you already need. You don't need anything more. In fact, adding more to it can be harmful for certain people in certain instances. That's just one of many examples about the natural marketing that we are bombarded with. I mean, daily, on our televisions, on our computers, in our earbuds and everywhere everywhere we look on billboards you can't escape it i mean that is it natural is the way to go um you know there's a lot of money to be made there and you know people <laughs> and companies will uh will, will go try to grab those dollars if, if that's what people want if that's what they want to hear so we try to make people aware of this so that they can be better consumers smarter consumers and especially especially for their health even more than their pocketbooks 
So he, so let me ask you a question. As you go through these topics in your book and you try to separate fact from fiction, mm-hmm. what's that rubric that you use? How do you find truth? What's that rule that you lay down and say, well, here's how we can tell what we should believe and what we shouldn't believe? What a great question. The one thing, if you're going to take away effectively from the book, and that will help answer that question, is a person's ability to understand their own limitations of their mind, of their brain, of their heuristics, of the way they think, and be aware that this is happening all the time, even though it's in the background a lot of the time, but it is always happening, and for people to check their own biases regularly, because we all have them. Joe, you have them. Al, you have them. No. Me, I have them. <laughs> it's not. It, it's nothing to be either ashamed of, embarrassed by, humiliated by, or feel like that somehow I'm a lesser person because of it. No, no, no. It's 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 as human as any other human condition you w- you wish to describe. Becoming aware of it though is is so important. It's it's I think more than half the battle for people if they were to be aware that what they think they're seeing, what they think they know is not accurate in a lot of ways and is influenced by your own other personal thoughts and beliefs, if you can recognize, just recognize that, that's like half the battle. Now, the rest of it is, is figuring out, like you said, what is true, what what is not true. For the other half of that battle and figuring that out, what it takes is, well, a couple things. Uh, patience, <laughs> which is a lot to ask for people in 2019, age of the inter- you know, age of internet 2.0, 3.0, in which we want to be able to see and absorb things in 10 seconds we lose interest and we're moving on moving on to the next thing it takes more patience people have to slow down and be a little bit more patient about what it is they are consuming whether they're putting it into their body or into their brain and they also have to be able to acknowledge that they got to go to more sources is better try to validate try to verify double check cross-check, see what the arguments are against whatever position it is you think you're taking or are interested in pursuing. Understand what the, uh, what the what proponents are saying and what opponents are saying on any given matter. You have to kind of slow down just a, just a little bit because you can't. You can't just fly at the speed of the Internet and think you're going to understand everything. You, you're just not going to. You're going to get bombarded with so much misinformation and disinformation before you even start to reach things that approach something that is more truthful. Uh, it's very challenging and very challenging for, for younger people who are brought up in, in, in this age. I have the, I'm 50 years old, so I, I was an analog kid. I'm a digital man. That's kind of how I describe myself. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I live half my life. In the pre-internet age, and now I'm living half my life after. So mm-hmm. I've seen the before, before and after. So got to be aware of that, and you have to you have to uh, slow down a little bit, be a little bit more patient with what it is you're trying to get to, and that will help you achieve a better understanding or get you closer to something that is the truth. So one thing that I think about a lot is all these fears that people have, whether it's about new technology. Um, or new medicines, um, but here's a review of your book, and this person is upset that you um, don't have enough skepticism of genetically modified food. Instead, they say you pay lip service to Monsanto. Mm-hmm. Um, what's the verdict on genetically modified food? Genetically modified food from a scientific standpoint, very thoroughly tested, very much looked at by uh, biologists, by food scientists, by so many people in their disciplines for a very long time. And the cumulative evidence is that GMOs are fine. They're, they're not frankenfoods. Maybe you've heard that term. It's at some point been bantered about out there that we're messing with, here we go again, nature, natural. It's not natural what we're, do, what we're doing here. Leave it alone. Better, you know, nature took a long time to figure this stuff out. What do, why are scientists now going in and modifying these things? Oh, it can only lead to bad results. Well, that's actually not at all true. It's a very, very big 
big topic, and it's something that um, our host, again, Steve Novella, has lectured on uh, precisely on this specific topic of GMOs, and because uh, it's just it just is a very big topic right now um, in our in our society, and the fear that people have of genetically modified organisms, they help in so many ways. Are you golden rice? I guess we should take that because that's kind of the primary example. Genetically modifying golden rice to add vitamins, nutrients to it that the people who rely on this as a staple crop around the world, we're talking billions, billions with a B of people rely on the golden rice as part of their, uh, on how to survive. If we can fortify these things with vitamins and nutrients that they are otherwise not getting, oh my gosh, so much, so much better for them. But you'll have the GMO opponents out there. So basically, who don't have a good argument against what's occurring with the golden rice, flapping their arms, saying, no, can't do it, can't do it. Well, why can't we do it? Why can't we enhance these food products with the vitamins that people need? Oh, because, well, not natural, or you just don't know what's going to happen on the bottom end. There could be mutations. What are the cancer risks? These things have been thoroughly, thoroughly studied, thoroughly vetted, and tested and proven to work. What is the problem here? GMOs, the bottom line is that they are safe. It's an effective, effective way to get people uh, important nutrients that they need in order to live and survive. And the people who are on the other side of the GMO debate, I'm not sure. I will not guess what their ultimate motivations are. They're, they're vast, uh, but they're all wrong in the end, and I, I don't think that they want to see people suffer as a result. I don't think that's where they're going with their arguments, but effectively when they are making those arguments, that is what is occurring. But if I go to the grocery store, and they have the regular strawberry, the natural strawberry, uh, for $6, the, the GMO-free, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's all natural, there's no pesticides, there's no GMOs, and the conventional strawberry, maybe it's GMO, maybe it's got pesticides, it's, it's half the amount. I must know that the $6 one is better, right? Why wouldn't I, why would I not automatically assume that? Isn't marketing a magical thing? <laughs> <laughs> it really is. It's amazing what you can convince people of. What is better, what is worse, what you should be paying more for, what you should be paying less for. Human psychology, Joe, I imagine you know this. There's just so much psych- psychology here at work. And in some ways, it can be very, very dangerous because what you'll get sometimes, and I know we're talking about GMOs and foods and strawberries right now, but you'll also sometimes get some people who will take this sort of tact and they will attack other things that, I, li- I mean, life and death things. It's one thing to be, you know, to deal with nutrition, food, and hunger. But it's another thing, for example, to use these kinds of arguments and tactics against vaccinations. Because a lot of the same arguments are used in the anti-vax world, is what we call them, the the people who are against vaccinating children and adults of these, to to, to rid the world of basically these horrible conditions and diseases. They will use similar attacks, they'll use similar sort of approaches in their arguments, and that has life or death consequences to it. I mean, it's one thing, you know, again, natural is, is, just, a mar- is just a marketing technique. Go ahead and put something that they deem unnatural, for example, a very, very tiny, minuscule trace amount of mercury as a preservative into a vaccination Okay, mercury is natural, by the way. It is on the periodic <laughs> table of elements. Go look it up for yourself, folks, if you if you don't believe me. That's na- mercury is natural. What's wrong with that? Nothing. Put a little, tra- you know, the very very fine fine super trace amount in order to preserve va- vaccinations and give them a little more shelf more shelf life to them. That used to, that ha- that has happened in the past with no issues, no problems, and that's it. You lost the. You, the anti-vaxxers come out, mercury, they're poisoning our children, this is terrible, they're modifying, they're doing these things, got to stop it, can't do it, this is terrible. Well, where's your evidence? Well, we don't really have the evidence, all we know is that this this is terrible. Well, here's some, correla- here's some corollary evidence here, this correlation, 
here's the mercury and the vaccinations, and here the autism rates are, are all spiking. Uh, va- vaccines, therefore, cause autism. This is horrible. This is terrible. Well, maybe one, you know, a, a long time ago, that may have been seen as some kind of fringe sort of way of thinking about it. You'd be, you know where we are today. There are throngs of people out there, millions upon millions of people who actually believe that the vaccinations are causing autisms and other problems, other diseases, cancer, and other things in human beings when they have absolutely no evidence to break it up, to in, in or, where they have absolutely no evidence to support their crazy theories about that. So I know we got a little off track there talking about the vaccinations, but uh, I wanted to sort of stress about how this is not just limited to uh, to the discussion of food and other thi- and things. It's it's also in our medicine very much so. So as we're heading into flu season, should people go out and get the flu vaccine? Will it give them the flu? Well, the first thing I would say to that is consult your physician, consult your doctor, because, well, and I say that because not everybody's the same. You know, elderly yeah. people, there's young people, there's pregnant women. So first thing you should do is consult your physician and see what their opinion on it. Gen- I can speak in a general sense, though. In a general sense, yes, people should get <laughs> the, the flu vaccine um, because, you know, the flu is a nasty, nasty thing, and that can kill people definitely kill people and if you're at some kind of in a risk group in one of the risk groups in, in which there is a higher risk of becoming extremely ill if not dead as a result of the flu it's it's really important for for people for people to get it when you have campaigns and you have a bunch of people and organizations out there who are coaxing others to not take flu vaccinations or, or get their MMRs or other scheduled inoculations I and mean, that that leads to a world a world of problems and that that's something we fight very very hard against um and we have been for for 23 years now and we will continue to for as long as we do this you know one of the big inventions of the last 20 or so years was the hpv vaccine to prevent cancers in mostly women but also in men now too mm-hmm um, and it was only a few years ago that a congresswoman was running for president. Her name was Michelle Bachman. Mm-hmm. And she went on stage at a, at a uh, debate, and she mm-hmm. said that a mother came up to her and told her that the HPV vaccine had made her child, quote, retarded. And uh, I couldn't tell you how upset I was that something that could be so life-saving would be besmirched in such a way and such scant evidence. Yet here we are now with a lot of people not getting that vaccine for their kids because they think it's going to do something bad to them. And 20, 30, 40 years down the road, that kid is going to be at risk for cancer, which they would not have otherwise been at risk for. Wherever Michelle Bachman picked up her information... Uh, it know, wasn't your book, obviously. Obviously, it was not there. No, nor nor our podcast. It's it it shows you how dangerous this can be when bad information gets into the hands of people who have the who have the ability to spread it to large groups of people. It's not just politicians and or lobbyists who, who lobby the politicians to get them to say and do and do certain things. That that's one that's one vector. Uh, another one comes out of unfortunately our, our Hollywood culture, our celebrity culture. Uh, you will find celebrities saying the exact same thing that Michelle Bachman has ha, has said in your example. Um, you know, I, I, I won't name, I won't specifically name them here. I don't think I need to, but they are prominent, what considered A-list celebrities. They have lots, big followings on Twitter, Instagram, all these other social media platforms. When they say something, you can bet millions of people are listening to what they're saying, and they're not. No way are they all equipped to really, really decipher exactly what it is they're saying. Or have the wherewithal to go ahead and do the double checking for themselves to see if what they're being told is accurate. They accept it because they look at their celebrities and their celebrity culture as authority figures. <laughs> and it's a horrible, horrible uh, thing that they are doing. They are shirking their great responsibility 
of having this sort of public um, avenue, this 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 soapbox essentially to millions of people at a time who will do and say, and many of which who will do and say what it is that their celebrities are telling them that they're doing. So whether it's a politician, whether it's a celebrity, whether it's an athlete, high profile, prominent people, when they say these things, that is sometimes the absolute worst because the damage that they can spread is so far and wide and quick by the time the truth eventually catches up to those people who might have been effective for some of them, it may be too late. Well, Evan, this is amazing. I I'd, I'd, uh, could talk to you forever or hear Joe talk to you. <laughs> we've, we've, only scra- we've only scratched the surface. My gosh, I know. there's so, so much but more. to. There is. It's endless, you know. It's, it is um, endless, yeah. It's, it's kind of um, – I find it very upsetting in the fact that um, people would rather believe – in something they read on the internet than someone that's an, an expert in their own field, you know, um, and that's that's what what I think uh, is most terrifying to me. It's a double-edged sword, most certainly, and sometimes we can only argue about which side is sharper. Or it's going to cause cause more damage <laughs> because there is, there's a lot of good resources out there. I don't want to I don't want to I don't want to cast a wide brush over this because and there have been some very good organizations doing very good work for a very long time even before the internet not just us but so many others Stephen Barrett at Quack Watch I don't know if you're familiar with his work uh, that that he's done Um, he he was one of the early early proponents of scientific based medicine evidence based medicine and calling out the charlatans and scam artists in the medical communities for, for what they were. I don't know if you folks are familiar with Dr. Dean Adell, America's doctor. Um, for years, even before the Internet, he was on the radio. He had at one point a listenership that was only uh, bested by, by the likes of Rush Limbaugh. Um, for, a while, for a long time, Dr. Dean was out there. Uh, the number two, essentially, voice in radio as far as number of stations and number of years that he was that he was reaching. And he's a great, great proponent of of good evidence based medicine, science based medicine, and calling out the charlatans for what they were. So I don't want to cast uh, a, a wide cloth over everything. However, no. the internet also has plenty and plenty of places in which people can go wrong um, and be steered. Uh, incorrectly down some very dark and dangerous paths. So part of our book, part of our podcast, part of everything it is we're doing is trying to make people aware of how to avoid those kinds of traps. And that's basically what it boils down to for us. Well, and Michelle Bachman has a website, and I know she's, uh, you know, talking about uh, climate change a lot right now, and that sure it's, o- it's okay because God will never flood us again, so we don't need to worry. Oh my gosh! We're just, we have to. <laughs> well, well, there you go. What, what I, can, I can leave. Leave it at that. Little, well, <laughs> science in one bubble, religious and faith in another bubble. May the two worlds forever stay <laughs> in their in their own spheres. When they overlap, though, boy, is that a mess. And um, we are not a uh, anti-religious podcast. We are not a. Uh, we, we don't besmirch people for the beliefs they they have or contain. That's not what it is. We we do. Um, however, when they do choose to make specific claims about things that can be tested in the scientific, physical, testable world. That is fair game, and we will de- most certainly go after that. But um, we'll leave people's, you know, beliefs into its own bubble and its own sphere for for them to uh, to uh, have fun with. So after all that, do you have contact information? Do you want people to contact you? <laughs> Boy, we would love for your listeners to <laughs> look, look for us at theskepticsguide.org. That is our website. Our podcast is available on all the major podcast platforms that are out there. We have a very robust and active Facebook group. We are on Instagram. We are on Twitter. We also have a series of YouTube videos as well from all the work that we've done over the years. Whatever we've been able to capture on video, we've put it up there. Obviously, our book is for sale as well. It's been out in hardcover for a year now. It's also called The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, How to Know What's Really Real in a World Increasingly Full of Fake. And, and, Coming up in this December, you will be able to get the Skeptic's Guidebook in paperback in America and all English-speaking countries around the world, England, Canada, 
Australia, elsewhere. So have a look for that. It makes a great, great holiday present for, for your family and friends. And we would love for you to send us your feedback, you know, whether it's on Amazon. Send us an email. We're very reachable. We're very approachable. We do read all emails and comments that we get. We can't always reply, but we do our best. And we're very grateful for, for the opportunity to share this information with everyone. Yeah, you guys are all over the place. The government really supports you guys. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, again, uh, we'll have that all linked to our website, so listeners can do one click and actually uh, find you. And uh, we appreciate you being here. Um, thanks for being, Evan. Al, Joe, this was a great pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back. 